Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. Hello, hello. This is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I've got Dr. Anthony Gustin back on the show. Anthony is a good friend from Austin or lives in Austin now. Uh, he's the CEO of Perfect Keto and Equip Foods. Anthony is someone that I really admire both from a personal and professional standpoint because he is incredibly intentional about how he approaches his personal life, his relationships, his learning, his business. And that's something that I really value in my own life. And so I'm always, uh, I'm always looking to learn from people in that regard. Today, we start out by talking about his experiment on the carnivore diet, which is eating all animal proteins, all animal meats. It's been a pretty rapidly, it, it's been growing in popularity or at least coverage because it's uh, it seems so extreme. And he's a thought leader in the nutrition space, wants to be able to speak about it, but he's the type of person that wants to experiment with things himself before he talks about them rather than just um, talk about talking about them to talk about them. And so that was a pretty fascinating discussion. We talk a little bit about the science behind it, what his experience was like, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, we talk about my keto experiment that I've been doing. Um, at Working Against Gravity, we just launched a keto coaching program. And so a D and I wanted to experiment with it ourselves for the same reasons that Anthony wanted to experiment with the carnivore diet. And I had some personal questions to ask Anthony as, um, you know, things that have popped up in my experiment. So uh, things like we talked about mental clarity and building on some self-awareness and changing my relationship with food. Uh, we talk about energy and hunger levels on keto and a number of other things. Then we talk about his work habits. Uh, he's a very disciplined person. He has a, an incredible like self-reflection process, and we dive into that. We also talk about the importance of solitude and how in today's day and age, we could go our entire lives without having any solitude. And we talk about what a big problem that can be and kind of the role that solitude plays in our life. And then finally, we talk about professional and personal growth, uh, something that he puts a premium on. This one was a fascinating show, and I know you guys are going to love it. Um, if you wouldn't mind and you haven't done so already, head to iTunes, leave me a quick review. Uh, and if you love the show, share it with a friend. Enjoy. Anthony, welcome back, dude. I am honored to be back for a second episode. I'm super pumped for this. Uh, I've learned over the years that the best, my best shows are always the ones where I'm genuinely interested in learning something from someone. And that doesn't, it doesn't, that's not always the case. Um, because I've learned that, I've, I've gotten better and better guests, people that I actually uh, admire and, and want to learn something fr uh, from, uh, but it doesn't always happen. And today, I, I'm just going to take, I'm, I'm going to be selfish and just talk about some things that I really want to learn about from you. And we're going to go in a few different directions. I want to talk a little bit about keto. We talked all about keto last time. Um, I've got lots of fresh insights and questions because I've been doing my own experiment on it. Uh, so I want to ask you about that. I want to talk about your work habits because I think you're someone that is incredibly disciplined and intentional about the way you work. And then finally about some, uh, how we use technology and your thoughts on solitude and more like philosophical stuff. Let's do it, man. Cool, man. So, uh, carnivore diet, you, you did an experiment. What is the carnivore diet? Why would you put yourself through that? What, what, what was your experience like? Yeah, I'm just a big believer of testing anything myself before I comment on it. So I knew that it was swelling up last year and I wasn't going to say anything negative or positive about it until I tried it myself, just kind of how I am. So I'm kind of a uh, human guinea pig. And so I said, screw it, let's do it. Let's figure out why people are getting results. And that's why I was interested in it because people, I mean, it sounds just ridiculous, but people were getting positive results. So they were seeing you know, joint inflammation go down, 
um, strength go up, a lot of blood markers improve, contrary to what a lot of people say, autoimmune conditions improving. So I thought, okay, there, there must be something to this. So I'm going to try it out and see what's going on. Had some hypotheses about why before I went into it, um, but I don't think that you can really surmise enough information to actually go through something yourself and experience it yourself. So I did about five and a half weeks of just eating only meat products. And so <laughs> that was it. A little bit of seasoning here and there, but, but generally like about a pound and a half, two pounds of meat per day. I took blood work before, um, took blood work afterwards, compared that stuff. Admittedly, I think it was a little short to, to determine if that would have been any sort of indication long-term, but some interesting findings there. Subjectively, I felt incredible, probably the best I've ever felt in my life. Really? Uh, More yeah, than keto? Yeah, energy was even better than like it, it felt like wow. going from like generalized standard American diet to paleo was like a, a phase shift for me. I was like, oh shit, this feels amazing. And then same thing when I went to keto, and then same thing here now again when I went to carnivore. So energy, mood, um, strength, essentially every single subjective measure in my life improved. So I mean, hunger levels, the my relationship with food, which I mean, we can get into that. I'm sure you've experienced some of that with eating keto, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I pretty much everything improved. Um, so that was interesting. Um, it's just extremely limiting and actually a pain in the ass to, if you want to eat anything, cook meat. Mm-hmm. And like you said, I'm very busy. I do a lot of work. And so it, it, to, to maintain it, I think was confusing, but I, I did like have a lot of illumination around that. So I think the the myth that a lot of people think about a ketogenic diet is that you should always limit your protein intake because I can kick you out of ketosis. Just not true. So I was eating upwards of 200, 300 grams of protein a day and no effect of levels of my ketones so levels of ketones were still high um and yeah i mean it was it was a crazy experience um i I think there's a lot of things there that could contribute to that so i've kind of skewed a little bit towards uh more protein than i was intaking before that experiment and i felt like i've kind of like come down above the baseline i was doing with keto before just generally eating a little bit more protein a little more animal products than i was before and kind of cycling in so fasting days and then maybe low protein days and high protein days which is Kind of evolutionarily, what we would have expected out of humans is that, you know, they would be fasting for a while. They'd find some shrubs or whatever, eat some stuff, some plants there, and then have a huge kill and eat a lot of animal in a few days and then probably fast again and kind of cycle through in and out of that. And so that's kind of how I've approached it a little bit. And I'm toying around now of like, okay, does this, do I feel best on like a one day fast, two days vegetables, five days meat, off and on and on like that? I don't know. So I'm, I'm kind of tweaking and playing around with it a little bit. And that's what's so exciting about nutrition and, and the stuff in general. I think I said last time that ketogenic diet is just, it's a tool. So I know that if I want really awesome energy and focus and stay relatively lean, that doing keto was super effective for that. And that's a tool I have in the toolbox for that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that carnivore is now another tool where if I like, I want to completely remove food. If I, if I understand like, you know, another thing that I noticed about it is that uh, the just like when fasting for long periods of time, three, four, or five days, you start to really understand where your hunger comes from mm-hmm. and your relationship with food. Like, are you eating because you're stressed? Are you eating because you're bored? Are you trying to distract yourself? And I think that when you have to cook a giant steak and eat a steak, or when you're not eating, those things become sort of the forefront of of your mental capacity around how why, how and why you're eating. And so, I think that just reestablishing a new baseline around that is is super super helpful. And I think that. Overall, if I wanted to increase strength or overall perform physically really well, I think that in the past, my tool for that was to add more carbohydrates. But now I think it's actually just to add more protein counterintuitively. So I think just updating my mental model and and upgrading my toolkit and not saying that like, I think that a lot of people are taking this way too far and almost to the extent of being vegans or vegetarians as so far as saying that like, this is the only way to do it. And if you're not doing this, you're an idiot. Mm. And I think that that's just damaging. We, I mean, we're so far away from knowing that. We know that plants do benefit us in a lot of different areas. But for some people, for a lot of re- like, for instance, I think that it could be good for a microbiome reset. I think that removing all fiber is essentially what I did in my clinics when I was working with people who had gut problems. And so that's essentially what a carnivore diet is, taking away that. Um, it's a ketogenic diet. So I think that a lot of people who are experiencing a lot of benefits are just because they're removing carbohydrates for the first time in their life and then they're doing a zero carb literally zero carb diet um, i think that people generally under eat protein so i think that when they eat protein then that that's great and they start to experience some of the effects of that i mean i think that it's a super nutrient dense diet so if you look at nutrient density across foods you know you have organ meats at top then plants and then far below that spices and herbs then vegetables and, and so on and so forth and so people are just eating at the top of that spectrum and eating only meat you actually get a lot more nutrients than you would otherwise. Um, it's also a really effective elimination diet. And so if you maybe are intolerant or sensitive to foods that you normally 
didn't know of. Um, I think that people get a little too carried away here and do these generic food sensitivity tests, which I think are bullshit. But I think that some people do have some autoimmunity to certain foods. When you remove everything besides meat, which is pr- pretty much what you are as an animal, then you're not going to have any of these sensitivities. So I think that there's a lot of reasons why it can be beneficial for people. But I also think that that doesn't mean that you should only eat that for the rest of your life or for years at a time. And I think that we'll, we'll probably find that eventually is that you know, people have maybe long-term micronutrient deficiencies. Like sometimes micronutrient deficiencies, like you, you get a lot with animal products, but they're skewed in such a such a crazy far end in just animal products that you may take two, three, four years to develop. Like when a, when a vegan goes on a complete vegan diet for the first time, they don't have vitamin B deficiencies for like two or three or four or 10 years. And then at that point, then now you you've had this long of time of basically your your nerve is not developing properly your brain function may be going down not noticing it so there's a lot of things that just in in nutrition take a long time to accumulate i think this we might find some stuff for people who are hardcore with carnivore for no like they don't need to be like people who Mm -hmm. are very uh stricken with autoimmune conditions and this works for them jordan peterson his daughter michaela peterson are kind of like a you know the forefront but also, we have someone like Sean Baker who probably doesn't need to be totally carnivore. And like if he ate a salad, he wouldn't be depressed and call, crawl into a mm-hmm. cave for three months like they would. And so there's, you know, I think there's people taking it a little too far instead of just realizing that it can be a tool that they can use every now and then to get certain results. Yeah, I always, I always appreciate your perspective on that and not, not putting too much dogma into it and kind of playing the middle of the road and saying, you know, we can use these things to our benefit, but they're not the only way. Uh, I think that's very, that's very clickbaity to take that type of approach of, you know, this is the only way and it gets a lot of attention, but in almost every, everything and every discipline, um, there, there is no thing like that, right? The, the, the one thing that rules all and the one, right. the one way to do something. Yeah. And so I would say people are looking to try it out. So I think a lot of people are kind of switching to it now is just don't do it like a dummy and like don't listen to these guys that are eating really low quality meat and only only hamburger or only ribeyes or whatever. Switch it up, eat different animals, eat fish, eat organ meats, eat connected tissue. Like you need a lot of these things. And I think that when you skip out on that stuff, you are going to get a micronutrient deficient diet for sure. Mm-hmm. So a bunch of different organ meats for a bunch of different animals as close to wild as possible. Get grass fed, grass finished stuff, get, get a lot of wild fish and really mix it up. Um, instead of just eating one source of meat all the time. Love it, dude. You mentioned the relationship of food and how, how you get in really get in tune with your relationship and food with diets like this. I have been absolutely blown away by the level of self-awareness that I've been able to build doing this keto experiment that I've been doing. You know, I, I always think of myself as a really self-aware person. I'm constantly working on personal development, et cetera. And yet I experienced exactly what you were talking about, where I thought I was starving at different points in this diet. And then when I just sat with it for five minutes, I would notice that I'm tired. I didn't get a lot of sleep last night and I just want to cover it up with food or I'm stressed out because I have a lot of work on my plate and I want to cover it up with food. And it's starting to teach me that anytime I feel discomfort or many times when I feel discomfort, I, my tendency is to want to cover it up with food. And I think it's such a valuable lesson to learn because it's so, um, it's so tied to so many activities that we do. And if we, if we don't become aware of this, then it leads to overeating and a really poor, uh, kind of controlled or, or, um, out of control relationship with food. Yeah. And I mean, I think that it's just ultimately a distraction from what you need to work on. And that's what I think a lot of life is, is starting to tease away where you're distracting yourself versus mm-hmm. where you're adding to your, like confronting problems and in, in, in facing yourself and your own, your own demons. And I think that, I mean, we have stuff like social media that feeds into that. We have, you know, work for me for a long period of time. And I think probably still now I do it a lot is, has been a distraction for working other personal things. So instead of working in relationships, I sometimes lean towards doing work because I know that that'll be, it'll come easier to me than trying mm-hmm. to build new relationships. I mean, that, that's happened since I moved to Austin, I think overworked. So I just to, to, to not have to face the fact that I should actually build a life here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that food is just another one of those things. And so it, it being aware of when you're using it for a distraction or when it's something that's actually nourishing you. And I think that all these things have a sort of dualism to them. So I think that 
food can obviously be great and nourishing, but it also can be a distraction. Work can be great and progressive and help a lot of people, but it can also be a distraction. Same with relationships mm-hmm. and pretty much everything else in life. So yeah, I mean, just being aware of that and having these checkpoints and, and reestablishing a baseline of knowing when it's a distraction or when it's um, actually value add is important. So something I've been working on for a really long time is just eating more slowly, eating mindfully. I mean, it's been an intention of mine literally for two or three years. And I felt, I feel like I've made about zero progress there. I feel like I'm almost never aware of it in the moment because I'm, I, I, you know, I just want to fucking stuff my face doing this keto experiment. Suddenly I'm just, I'm eating more slowly. I'm appreciating the food that I'm eating and I haven't really been able to wrap my head around it. I think, um, I think part of it might have to do with I'm eating lower volume meals. And so I want, I, I want to take a little bit more time because I don't want to feel hungry when I'm done eating. Uh, but do you have any other insights on why that might be, why I might be naturally eating a little more slowly? Yeah. I think that the, the blood sugar stabilization is a huge component to it. So I think that a lot of people don't appreciate because they don't test their blood sugar often is that if you're eating generally even moderate to to mid, low, or high carbohydrates and not fully in a state of ketosis. Wait, did you just say low, medium, or high? (laughs) So moderate or like low, like low, moderate. So like even if you're eating like 100 grams, 75 grams of carbs per day, Mm -hmm. you're you're probably not going to be in a state of ketosis. Therefore, your hunger levels are going to be stimulated primarily by a dip in blood glucose, not necessarily hunger. And so your body is running on two different fuel sources primarily for people who haven't maybe listened to the listen to the previous episode on ketosis. And if you're running on glucose or the breakdown of carbohydrates, you basically can you can only pull so much of that out of your liver or stored muscle cells. And you can only hold about two tablespoons or two teaspoons, sorry, like five or six grams of sugar in your bloodstream at any time. So when you eat a meal, your body goes through that and then starts storing it in different tissues. And then once that's gone. Well, then your body asks, okay, where's more of that anemia fix? Whereas it's very easy actually to mobilize fat for energy. So if you're working on ketones, which is the breakdown of fat, you, you get hungry, obviously, because you, your body wants a source of that. But generally speaking, in between meals, you can go much longer and not have this ravenous hunger that you would have otherwise. So mm-hmm. probably the speed to which you're eating and, and like the, I need to eat now was from a, a blood sugar stabilization issue and not necessarily like, a, I mean, I'm sure some of it came from you know, you're trying a new diet for the first time. You probably haven't been this strict for, for probably a long period of time. Maybe that's not right. I don't know, but that could be an issue. But I think that probably if you were to map out your blood sugar mm-hmm. in the course of a 24 hour period with how you used to eat versus now, it's probably way more stable now. And the more stable it is, the less ravenously hungry you will be. Yeah. Interesting. So, I had a fascinating uh, conversation with our friend, Justin Mayers. So, for those of you who don't know, it's uh, one of, one of, Anthony's partners at Perfect Keto and the owner of Kettle and Fire. And I was telling him that I've been struggling, you know, my, it was my words that I was struggling to get into like, quote unquote, deep ketosis. And I've been around, I've been between like 0.2 millimoles and 0.9 millimoles of ketones in my blood. And a D on the other hand is like two point something or over three at some, at some points. And what he was saying is that he, he has a hard time believing in the blood glucometer reading somewhat because it's not taking into account how efficiently your body is using ketones. And so if I'm like his kind of theory is that if I'm really like my body is really efficient at using ketones and uptaking them, then I'm going to have a lower reading, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm in a less, uh, I don't know. I'm less in ketosis. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I think this is one of the things that I texted you guys like super early on when you were freaking out because, because the D was shooting up and you were, you were staying low <laughs> yes. and you're maybe feeling inferior to a certain degree. Um, yes. Yeah. I think that the blood glucose reading is a good indicator directionally of where you're going, but I don't think that it really matters at all as far as any indication of being in ketosis or how you feel. So I think if the ketones are in your bloodstream, they're not in your cells. And like, that's where it matters for them to be burning for energy. Like you want them in your cells, in your mitochondria being used for energy. And the fact that you just have a lot of muscle mass, I mean, the D is very fit as well, but females tend to already skew a little higher 
on ketone levels. But I mean, the, the amount of muscle mass you have, like usually the, the leaner and more muscular a male is, the lower his ketone levels will be. Hmm. And I would say at that point, like it's, it's kind of tough because you have so many people on, on the internet having these ketone level competitions and like thinking they right. get some award for having a higher level of ketones. Like it, it just doesn't matter. And so, especially the more metabolically flex, flexible you are. So, which means you, what? Which means like if you can, like if, if, if I were to eat carbs today, my ketones would go down to zero. But because I go in and out of ketosis so much, then tomorrow, if I fasted in the morning, I'd probably be spitting out ketones again. My, my body can go from burning glucose to burning fat really easily just because I am always in and out of these states. Whereas people who have a little bit more metabolic damage, it takes a longer period of time. So what happens when you first switch to a ketogenic diet, your ketone levels will be really, really high because you're not actually putting them in your cells and using them. So your, your body is, okay, we need an energy source. Let's break down these fatty acids and put them in the bloodstream as ketones. Um, but your cells don't really have the receptors to pull them into the cell to be used as energy. And so if you're more active or if you're more muscular or have more tissue demand for energy, those ketones are going to be out of your bloodstream and into your actual cells. That's why mm-hmm. the blood ketone meter will be actually a little bit lower. And so, so is the... Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say is the best... And I think you've already, you, you were the one that originally gave me this advice is just really pay attention to how you feel and give yeah. yourself an honest assessment. And if you feel great, then awesome. Yeah. It's one of the things that we looking at subjective measures when ketosis is going to tell you way more about it. And like a lot of times you can correlate this stuff with maybe some blood readings, but there's going to be some, some, I would get say false negatives in your case. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, if your energy is high, you don't have a lot of sugar cravings, like your appetite's reasonable and like you you sleep really well and all these things chances are that you, your body has enough ketones to be burning right now mm-hmm. and I, like, I don't know if you've kind of noticed this transition and if you had like a stabilization of mood and energy like that's the biggest one for me that i noticed of like eating carbohydrates a couple of weeks ago and i noticed like okay every two or three hours i have an energy dip which is fine like my body was craving a lot of carbohydrates and i was like okay it's time to eat some carbs and that's kind of how i intuitively eat now but then I was starting to notice like, okay, I'm certainly not in ketosis now. And then I fasted for three days and my ketone levels were not going up and my energy felt worse and worse and worse. Hmm. So I cut the fast um, just because I think that I'm under a lot of stress at work and I have a lot of other things going on that maybe prevented my body from going into like more of a recovery mode. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that subjective measures are, are a better indicator of, ke- of state of ketosis than, you know, stuff in your blood or even in your urines, an even worse indicator of your state of ketosis because it's just basically okay whatever's in your blood and then not getting, getting used and goes to your kidneys and filters out and then that spills over into your bloodstream but the more your body uses it again the more you'll hold on to the ketones and not excrete them mm-hmm. so t- talk to me a little bit about the the whole mental clarity piece you know before i started this i i was very skeptical about it and I thought, I was telling you for a while, man, I know, man, I know. And you, you weren't the only one. I, you know, I, I thought to myself, I meditate all the time. I give myself tons of rejuvenation. I probably won't experience that, that big of a difference. And it has been mind blowing, man. Last week was the best. I think I can ever remember my, my brain feeling. I just felt totally clear headed. I made, um, I was like, I was more relaxed. I was more present and it was an incredibly valuable experience so much that I'm like, that, that was the first time I thought, man, this could be something that I, a tool that I use for a very long period of time or for the rest of my life. Not, not something that I constantly am in, but something that I, I definitely want in my life. What's, what's really going on there? What's the, what's the current theory with the mental clarity? Yeah. So it's not a theory. It's actually, we understand the science, the ketones, they can be metabolized for energy way easier in the brain than can glucose. And also when glucose is metabolized in your brain, it shoots off basically some waste products that can clog things up and require more clearance. And so it just requires far more energy for glucose to be burned in the brain than ketones. And so and not only that, but again, once your blood sugar starts dipping, the energy available in your brain starts uh, plummeting rapidly, especially again, if you have more muscle mass, because your muscles are very metabolically active and they're going to want glucose for energy if you're not taking any ketones. And so if you have ketones, your body can basically always be spitting them in your bloodstream. And then basically the less you eat, the more you'll have ketones. So the more you're fasted, I don't know if you've done any like really long-term fasts, but even when you eat fat, like your body will still keep a lot of ketones in your bloodstream. So basically you have an unlimited supply of energy for your brain at all times. Mm-hmm. Instead of this rise, crash, rise, crash, 
And even when it is in your brain, it's kicking off all these, um, just a lot of garbage and a lot of waste that has to be cleared mm-hmm. out as well. And this is like what a lot of people are theorizing that Alzheimer's, they're going to start calling type three diabetes because it's, it's essentially there's a mechanism there we found where all this waste product over time damages the cells in the brain. And so it's basically like a, a, a glucose sensitivity or insensitivity in your brain. So your brain can't take up glucose, glucose for energy anymore. So, yeah, I mean, that that's the reason why I use ketogenic diet primarily is because my, I just perform so much better on it mentally. So when you go back into more like a, a paleo diet where you're eating very similar to keto, but you're just having more vegetables, maybe some potatoes, things like that. What, like how significant is the difference and how, and can you describe that? For, from a mental capacity? Yeah. And, and anything else that you think is significant about that change? Yeah. Again, I think that it's just like, for, for me, I just uh, listen to my body and do what my body asks for. And so for, if I crave carbohydrates for a while, um, then I just know like, okay, it's time to, to put them back in for maybe a week or two. And so for instance, two weeks ago, started eating more potato. Like I had like purple sweet potatoes and plantains. It's pretty much the things that I eat when I eat carbohydrates. I've just noticed over a long period of time that those affect my blood sugar the lowest. So mm-hmm. I've tested that on myself, the purple potatoes, especially it's like very little blood glucose response. And the thing is that again, because my body goes in and out of the state so much and I usually time them like around workouts then I just don't have that much of a, of a shift out of ketosis. If I'll eat a bunch of carbs a couple of days in a row, it'll be more of like a sluggish energy through like in between meals. And I feel just like I can't focus and do really hard, deep work for, you know, in a state of ketosis, I can do it for four or five, six hours at a time. It's more like one hour bursts if I eat carbohydrates. doesn't mean I can't get there. It's, just, it's, it's not a sustained maxed out effort all day if I needed it. Gotcha. So I've... I've definitely had some fear around the transition out of it because right now it it works extremely well because I have very clear boundaries with myself and I'm afraid once I don't have as clear boundaries that I'm going to, you know, kind of, um, the whole, like, give yourself an inch, you take a mile. I feel Mm -hmm. like I'm going to always take a mile. And so my question is, what have you seen to be the best way for people to transition back into having some carbs, but not slipping back into bad behaviors? Totally depends on the, yeah, I guess I would ask that person what their goal is. And so it totally depends on the person and what their goal is, what they're trying to get out of it. If, if you said try to try to max mental performance, I would say, don't eat carbs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and as that's how I'd say it. If if it was I want to eat carbs because I want to enjoy food, or if it's because I want to work out and and build more muscle mass and do all these other things, like I think there's certain strategies you can do there. But yeah, I, I guess it would totally depend if it's just to enjoy carbohydrates. Then that's a different story than to use it for a different tool. So if you want to give me some more, yeah, let's some, say yeah. For for me, the only reason. I want, I want to go back to eating some carbs is for enjoyment. Like I, I really miss, yeah. I, w- I want to eat way more vegetables. Uh, I want to eat some potatoes and I want to have the option to eat processed foods occasionally. Okay. So I would say the first step is to start understanding your carb tolerance with things. So take these subject- subjective measures and see, okay, what can I get away with? Can I like, okay, I want to eat more vegetables. I want to eat these types of vegetables. Can you eat those and still stay in ketosis? Mm-hmm. Can you time them around workouts and still stay and like get best of both worlds? Maybe with your body size and the way you work out. Um, and then after you hear that, how he keeps say, you can hear how he keeps hitting on me, guys. <laughs> you have so much muscle mass. Well, I mean, yeah, so you work out before you <laughs> mini Hulk here. Um, and this is something where like it, after that, then you go, okay, here are all the other carbs I want to eat. Maybe it's plantain, sweet potatoes, regular potatoes, this, this, and this. I would independently test your blood sugar around them. And then mm-hmm. figure out which your body agrees with the most. And it's just different for everybody. So, for instance, I ate, especially because I've recently been toying around with a continuous blood glucose monitor. So, mm-hmm. I have a little thing <clears throat> implanted in my belly. And it'll tell me, like, over the course of however long I want to look back, how my glucose has responded. Martha brought me up some snacks once when I was wearing it. And I ate a fourth of an apple. And it the, the alarm went off on this thing. And basically said my blood glucose was at a dangerously high level after eating a fourth of an apple. So I go, okay, apple is not really worth it to me. Even though I like to taste of apples, like if I want a carb, then I'll switch to plantains or I'll switch to potatoes. I think figuring like a little bit of a catered like individual plan for yourself mm-hmm. for what type of carbohydrates you respond best to and just go, okay, if I have a carb craving, I'm going to choose these instead of those. 
Mm. And then if you want to have croissant or whatever process stuff, like then just know that you'll have to get back on track and you can use like exogenous ketones or stuff like that or fasting afterwards to get back on track quicker. Mm-hmm. But generally speaking, I, I think the most underestimated thing in health that is the most easiest thing to track is blood sugar, blood glucose. And so you can get a $5 meter from Walgreens and get these tests that are basically free to prick your finger, like take a baseline before you eat the food and then eat the food. And then every 15 minutes until you're back to baseline, then test it and see how high did I spike? How long did it take to get back to baseline? And then the higher and the longer it takes you to get back to baseline, the worse that food is for you metabolically. And the more it's going to kick you out of ketosis, the more inflammation it's going to lead to you. And just the more I, I would say cellularly destructive that food would be. Mm-hmm. And so for instance, potatoes, the, the purple sweet potatoes specifically raised my blood sugar like 15, 20 points for like 30 minutes, which is nothing. The apple raised it like 115 points for two hours. Wow. Like other quote unquote keto bars or like low carb bars raised my blood sugar 80, 90 points for three, four hours. Wow. That's not good. And so wow. you're basically for four hours processing this infl- really inflammatory compounds until you get back to baseline, which mm-hmm. is not good. And so again, your, your body can only carry around five, six, seven grams of sugar, basically broken down glucose or uh, broken down carbohydrate in your bloodstream at any given time. So if you have more than that, your body goes, okay, stop everything else. We need to get this stuff out of our bloodstream immediately. Where does it go? It's like shove it over here, shove it over there. It's basically like a, a, a fire alarm every time you eat carbohydrates over that amount. And so if you're using a lot of stored muscle glycogen, one, it's a, it's a myth that you, you can't restore that with fat in, in eating ketogenic diet because actually fats, triglycerides, that's just three fat fatty acids on a glycerol backbone. That glycerol turns into glycogen, can turn into glycogen. So you can have gluconeogenesis with the backbone of the triglycerides, a stored fat. So you don't really need to eat carbohydrates, but if you are working out a lot and you are depleting that stuff, when you eat carbohydrates, it can go more towards that and less into fat cells and less into inflammatory pathways. And so seeing your own response to eating foods from testing your blood sugar is probably one of the most important things that anybody could do for their own health. And so how you and I respond to white rice could be completely different. Black beans, plantains, any carbohydrate source is very, very, very individual. So a lot to do with your own gut microbiome, your muscle mass, um, your metabolism, your metabolic history, your genetics, all these things play into it. That's why with carbohydrates and even fats to some degree, there is absolutely no one size fits all, uh, glycemic index is a bunch of bullshit. It's so individual. Some people, I mean, they've done a study that Rob Wolf mentions a lot, which they took people and gave the, gave one group cookies and bananas and the other group cookies and bananas. And some people responded super high to the bananas and some not at all to the cookies. And so if we were to take that, you'd say, oh, well, cookies are better for, for everybody. No, for these groups of people, it just so happens that probably flour and sugar, not as much as fructose, spike their blood sugar. So you need to test this stuff on yourself. 100% if you're going to reintroduce carbs and then start learning what foods your body tolerates over time. And then maybe in a couple of years, test the thing again, because your microbiome can change, your right. epigenetics can change, your environment can change, your metabolic history can change. And so always surveying this stuff and seeing how you respond to foods is super important. But so, that being said, before I, I stop uh, on this little rant is a precondition to all this stuff is that real food will always be better. So I know you said that you wanted to throw in processed foods every now and then that, I mean, just stick with real foods the majority of time if for anybody Mm -hmm. who wants to try this stuff because even if you are testing cookies and it comes lower than banana the banana is still overall going to be much better for you from levels of inflammation vegetable oils things like that so that would be something that would for sure like as a foundation to your nutrition choices is is key i love it man fascinating man um guys if you're interested Anthony and I have created a keto coaching program at Working Against Gravity. Uh, You can learn more about that at workingagainstgravity.com. But moving on from keto, let's talk about your work habits, man. Oh, man. (laughs) What does a typical day look like for you? Well, I mean, the the reality of it is the last two years or so has this vicious cycle of pretty much like two weeks to a month of me feeling like a piece of shit and not feeling like I know what I'm doing to feeling like I mastered something for about a week. Then my role can changing a complete 180, mm-hmm. then going through that again and again and again and again. So I would say it's been pretty, pretty crazy. And right now I have a pretty solid routine um, since we've not been traveling as much this year. But um, as far as like a 
getting set for the day. I know I told you about my routine last time, but it's pretty, pretty set now where like I get up, meditate, have tea, um, start the sauna that we have now, which is amazing. Hit a workout, then get in the sauna and then get out and like get ready for the day and then start working. So like guaranteed if I do that, I cannot have a bad day. Mm-hmm. So that's like my new life hack, like that specific stack of things. Um, I also, also journal in, in the sauna. So pretty much get <laughs> everything done in that, in that like two hour window. So that's amazing. Um, but I think that we also chatted about last time around my prioritization and my spreadsheet that kind of holds my entire life together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Nothing's really changed from that. Um, I think that just my role has changed so many times over the last few years. I've just like always trying to make sure that I, I, one, I'm not screwing up. So like asking myself on a very continual basis of like, okay, is this the most important thing I could be doing right now? Yes or no. And then ranking all the things on my to-do list and just doing a very, very, very frequent audit of, okay, here's the 5,000 things I need that are on my to-do list right now. Mm-hmm. Of these things, what now versus when I put them on my um, to-do list are irrelevant? Which can I just, just discard, don't have to do anymore? Right. So a lot of people don't realize that, okay, let's say I put something on and then two weeks later, I'm going through my to-do list it's still on there. That thing might be entirely irrelevant because of everything else and now it's changed. So I think that that's super important to look at. Um, the next is, okay, now based upon the two weeks, has anything changed where I can delegate this to somebody else? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then after that, um, just thinking about, okay, now that I take those things off, what are the things that only I can do that are the most important or effective for the task at hand currently? And yeah, honestly, it's like it, sometimes I need to do that on a day, to, day by day basis. Sometimes I need to do it on a week over week basis and just understand when I'm again using work as a distraction or just being ineffective, which can happen really, really easily. So having checks on that is super important. But yeah, I mean, it, I'd say it's kind of, kind of all over the place, but just trying to um, keep my systems in check. I mean, I looked back through last year, I did a big yearly review and I saw throughout my tracker. So I use it every day throughout the year and I have this kind of this color coded system where I put in all my information and it spits out a color, like a, a red if everything was off, yellow if it's kind of like, okay, you should probably look at this in, in a green if everything's on track. I haven't traveled in at all this year and everything's been green 100%. I looked back last year and after every time I traveled, it could could go off track for anywhere from two to four to, to five weeks until I get back. What, what are some of these things that are going into oh, the red? Yeah, everything. So the way I assess work, the amount of work I get done, the all the personal stuff that leads to amplification of work, my nutrition, everything. So mm-hmm. relationships, the amount I drink, like every quantifiable thing that I track um, went out the door. Right. And so trying to come up with like learning from that and going, okay, knowing that, this year, I'm going to travel, for instance, going to San Francisco next week for community education stuff. And coming back, I blocked off the two days after I get back Nice to go over a review period and they completely blocked up my schedule. So it, I found that if I go back from a travel day or even a week or two weeks or whatever and have to get back into reactive mode, take a bunch of meetings, do all that stuff, play catch up, then I'm just too distracted and I can't get back on track. But if I block mm-hmm. one or two days when I get back, no mm-hmm. problem. So I have that time and I'm going to go, okay, what's most important? I can do those exercises. I have space for it. It can be more strategic. And so just trying to learn from, from this feedback and, and getting that stuff on the right track. And I think that's the biggest thing of like having these systems and this uh, accountability checklist and spreadsheets and all that stuff is that it's one thing to have the data, but if you're not doing anything about it, then what the hell's the point? Right. And this is the same thing about like when people have health trackers and Aura Ring and Apple Watch and all this shit. It's like, okay, you're getting this. I, I walked 5,000 steps today. Was that good or was that bad? Or like, does it help you meet your goals? I mean, what is the point? And I think that a lot of people, when they start to do productivity things and, and work and, and being aware of that, also don't really get feedback from it. They go, okay, well, I did two hours of deep work. Okay, well, did you get closer to reaching your goal? Did it actually help you? in that regard? Or is it just something that you're now checking off a list because it's in the top 10 things entrepreneurs do now? You know? mm-hmm. And like, there's so many of these things of, you know, it, to be successful, you have to do these different work hacks and all this bullshit. And like, I just, I don't agree with that. I think that people need to try stuff, get feedback and incorporate and learn from it instead of just adding things to your to-do list or mm-hmm. optimizations or any of these things. I mean, this stuff is just getting too popular now where in, I think that a lot of people have the opportunity now that they didn't before you and I included. I think that we're, we're both firmly in that camp, but I think that people over-prescribed a lot of these tips and tricks 
And I think that people just have the mindset of what can I learn from whatever I'm doing? And like, well, how can I improve? And did this work? Or did this not work? Mm-hmm. That would be more fruitful for the individual. I mean, same as like I was talking about before with your own individual response to eating potatoes. Same thing with your, your individual response of your morning routine or how you structure things. Probably wildly different from how I get output from it. But people are searching for these little hacks and these shortcuts that I think that they end up doing things without learning from them. And I think right. that's not great. Right. And they're constantly just trying to do what works for other people. Exactly. Right. Without, without really paying attention to what uh, fits in their lifestyle and fits with their personality, et cetera. I've found that the, the number one thing that's helped me in this regard is journaling. Spending time doing two or three pages a day, it allows me to really reflect on the day before. That I think that's been the most powerful piece is reflecting on the day before and I'll just naturally write about things that worked really well or things that didn't work really well. And because I'm writing about it, I'm kind of crystallizing this thought. I'm able to build upon it. And then I'm able to, uh, I feel like I'm able to go out and implement it rather than just having a fleeting thought of, you know, this certain habit helped me today and then it just being gone, right? right? And me forgetting about it. I feel like I've been able to be much more consistent because of it. Yeah. And th- that's the thing I have daily, weekly, and monthly reviews and a yearly review that incorporate all of those things for me that I've found works the best. So mm-hmm. that that process has been a, like, a, I've learned what works best for me over the course of the last five or six years. And now I'm kind of at a point where like, I'm still adding and tweaking a little bit, but it's more about a, a small scale refinement. But yeah, I know exactly. And I can go, I can run through that same type of checklist in my head. Like I think that having shut down time. So my girlfriend, Martha and I, I mean, we, at the beginning of the year put down, I mean, we, her business and her work is taking off and, and doing a lot of stuff and, and mine, the same thing. So we figured that, okay, we are now to the point where we can just work indefinitely. Mm-hmm. And so we have now a shutdown time that we put on each other's calendars where we, we have a 15 minute reminder and say, okay, now from this point on from the rest of the night is our time. So like when I have that, then I can back out and go, okay, I need to be done at this time. Therefore, 30 minutes before, I'm going to kind of check everything I did today, what went well, what didn't go well, what needs to be done tomorrow as a priority. It, you know, if things didn't get, didn't get done today, why can I kick those to somebody else? Can I delegate them? And then kind of arrange everything for the next day and then move on. And then my weekly checklist and my monthly checklist are a little bit more intensive, obviously, because they encapsulate more time. But yeah, I mean, it's something that we've been toying with for a while and it's uh, certainly helpful to have that shutdown time for, for us anyways. That is the perfect segue. So I know we're both huge fans of Cal Newport and he wrote, he wrote the books, um, too good. Uh, so good. What is it? They can't ignore so you good. They can't work. ignore you. And then deep work. Uh, have you read digital minimalism yet? No, is this new brand spanking new Ooh. man, brand spanking new. And it is fucking phenomenal. And one of the, one of the biggest points that he brings up is that in today's day and age, we we can go our entire life with ze- having zero solitude right we can we can spend a lot of time alone like literally like by ourselves but we can spend zero time in our head like uh, alone with our thoughts because we're constantly um it, it's constantly possible that we're getting feedback uh, from other people or other institutions, whether it be social media, music, podcast, uh, videos. We can constantly be filling our minds with someone else's thoughts so that we are not ever alone with our own thoughts. Mm-hmm. And he he brings up all of these, uh, you know, big time thought leaders throughout history and how like the importance that they put on solitude. And so you just started talking about kind of your shutdown time. Uh, but I also know that you're, you carve out time in your month and in your year for some solitude. So what's the importance of solitude in your life and um, how does that look like logistically? Yeah. So over the last three or four years, I was pretty diligent about it. And so every single month I would do two, two to four days roughly in the Bay Area where I'll go somewhere and, and just completely unplug, not be on any any sort of device, not a computer, anything, and just basically fill an entire sketchbook with my thoughts. Um, that when we moved to Austin last February, since it was just so many things are changing and the business was growing so fast, I kind of lost that a little bit. And 
I could see it. And that's where a lot of these red weeks would come from. Um, now that we are at a more stable point, that's something that I've just scheduled out almost throughout the rest of this year. And so quarterly we've been doing, um, so Martha and I are doing five to seven days, complete unplug. So we did that in January. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you that so- silence in solitude and just something where like you actually spend time spinning things around in your head and, and like thinking things through is, is imperative. And I think that I've now scheduled that out also two to four days every start of the month. And then like I told you, every time I come back from a vacation or a travel or anything that's work related or not, mm-hmm. blocking off at least one day for that. And so stuff like... Now I just have to be diligent about putting it in my calendar and, and having my assistant and having a lot of other people hold me accountable to it because there right. is so much work to do that. It's hard sometimes to see that on the calendar, like, but I could get so much done. But realizing that when you do take that time, you do step back, it, it just helps you progress so much, so much faster and do the right things when you do go back mm-hmm. in a very, very different way. And enjoy your life along the way, right? Oh, yeah. You're actually able to be present when you have that. Totally. And this is something too, like it, we're starting to incorporate now at least one day a week where we go on digital detoxes. Uh, where like I'm, tr- I'm trying to think about how I can get the stuff in. Austin's not as easy as Bay Area to get away, in my opinion. Mm-hmm, like you have mm-hmm. to probably pretty much fly anywhere unless you want to s- drive three, four, or five hours. Right. Whereas Bay Area is like 45 minutes, and, you, and you're like you completely change your scenario. So I'm trying to think of other ways now that we're here and, and kind of nestled in to get the same benefit without mm-hmm. having to have the extremism of leaving. And right. I think that's kind of where I've defaulted to in the past. More so probably that distraction than anything else. And like that's something I've learned about myself as well as like travel to me in the last couple of years has been a giant distraction away from, like you said, like hunger and things like that can be. Um, travel for me has been a, a way to escape and a way for me to not to face my problems. And so like, okay. Right. But also good. Again, we're looking at dualism here. We're like, it can be good, but it also can be distracting. And so same mm-hmm. thing about, okay, a week over week basis. So we should we have Saturdays or Sundays be completely uh, digital detox days. Um, I mean, it, whenever we've tried it out, we've felt amazing and actually spent time together, even though like we're very, very good at that. Um, I mean, we did a couple of weekends ago here where we did the entire weekend, no devices. And I think that that's something that we didn't realize, even if we have our phones around or replying to things or even texting other people, you lose this connection with the people you're with. And when you just eradicate technology from your life, you can connect on such a deeper level mm-hmm. um, just by default. Dude, you're going to love this book. I promise you. Listeners, I want you to buy Digital Minimalism. It is phenomenal. I don't know if I've taken this hard of a stance on a book on the show yet, but it's so damn good. Solitude. Um, So the, the distinction or the definition he gives of solitude is simply giving yourself space to be alone with your thoughts. So, and he distinguishes that from being out in nature like you don't Mm. need to be out in nature you don't need to be far removed from society Um, and in fact thoreau when he wrote walden was only like 30 minutes from a big city you know uh, but a lot of people think about that book and think oh he was way out in nature and in order to be in solitude i have to go and live in a, a log cabin out in the middle of nowhere and that was that was not the case so really all it means is being alone with your thoughts all that to say every single morning i spend about 90 day uh 90 minutes alone with my thoughts uh we do meditation yoga and journaling for about that amount of time so i've got a really good a really good space every single day like you do to just be quiet um, with no no intention to really get anything done. Um, and it allows me to mull things over. It allows me to really ease into my day and not be immediately reacting to the world, right? I'm, I'm, I'm able to be more proactive. Some other ways are blocking out either weekends or trips or whatever to be completely unplugged. I think that's a a super valuable thing to do, like have an extended period of time with no technology. And then I've gone through periods of doing more walks right outside our house. And those have been really phenomenal. There's something, something awesome about the combination of being alone with your thoughts, not plugged into something and moving at the same time. Um, a lot of people talk about that as well, but yeah. So my intention is to walk more. Hmm. It's amazing. One of the things that 
you brought up, which I think is super important that I do pretty frequently is like, I'm a, I'm a notorious uh, infovore is what Justin uh, Maris calls it, which is like just taking in tons and tons of information. Like I yes. usually read over like 50 to 70 bucks a year and just crazy on podcasts. But I mean, for the last couple four weeks or so, when that morning routine, like I usually would have done like audiobooks or podcasts or whatever. I've just, n- n- I haven't even done music, just silence. And it's so much more calming and grounding and mm-hmm. like ideas will come and things will come in that. I'll take notes on my phone. Uh, and just like having periods of time, a month at a time, a couple of weeks at a time, where like I'm consuming no more information. Mm-hmm. It's so easy now because you feel like you're like you get sent all these articles and you have all these things to read or things to listen to. And it's this unlimited information that's really hard to say no to. You have mm-hmm. this, at least I do have this FOMO right. of like not learning or not upgrading and, and not like leveling up to a certain degree. 100%, man. It, and that's been a, a tricky one to overcome for sure. But yeah, I've noticed that every time I've stepped back, I could go back and then learn this stuff even better or f- pick the stuff that actually matters to me mm-hmm. and, and be more clear about my priorities and have better guardrails on my life that way. Right. Yeah, that that, that was literally about my next question. Uh, before we get into that, I had a conversation with our mutual friend, Zach Obrant recently about this. And I was saying, I was it, so for those of you who don't know, Zach owns a publishing company called Scribe. And I was talking to him about the fact that most of the content I consume via books is audiobooks. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've felt like I have just a kind of a l- much lower attention span to read these days for whatever reason. And I was asking him what his thoughts were on that. And he said, when he when he listens to books, he retains almost nothing. When he reads them, he retains like a small amount. But when he reads and takes notes, he retains almost everything. Hmm. And so I've also been on the same train of thought as you as like, I'm taking in way too much information. And I really don't feel like I'm using much over 10% of it. Right. And I've been, my intention this last year has been to do le- do less with more, with more intention and with more effort. That's been kind of my theme. And so I'm trying to take that approach with reading and listening and just doing like one chapter at a time and taking notes and like really writing about it. And I found that I understand and comprehend it so much better. Like I can have a conversation about digital minimalism, this book so much better than if I would have listened to it because I'm just like mulling over the thoughts and I'm I'm writing about how it fits in my life. And it's a totally different experience that I'm loving. Yeah. I think that though there is a level of osmosis that you get from reading that I think the people Mm -hmm. underestimate. And so they think that like, okay, if I didn't take notes, if I didn't do this, it's kind of worthless. I think that there's a, a layer of permeation into your brain that you don't mm-hmm. realize. And at least I think that that's been the case for a lot of the books that I've read where it's like, okay, I maybe not be able to recall certain things in certain chapters, but it can change your direction of thinking right? and influence you in a certain way that is still valuable for sure. Um, the system that I use is I usually use a Kindle and take um, just highlight all the way through the book. And then like once a month, I'll go and, and look through all the books I've read and then I have a, a column in my spreadsheet that says all uh, of the books you've read. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's a lot of books. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I track everything. Everything I, I, re- I read, I, I put in a column You're for a my yearly sick spreadsheet. Puppy. You're a and sick then, puppy, man. And then that can track. <laughs> then once a month, I go, okay, these are the books I read. Is it worth going back and looking at the highlights of this book? And then if it mm-hmm. is, then I go back through, and then I'll go through my highlights and, and make this kind of like master list in my Evernote of all the things and, and then do this thing you're saying of is kind of like think about it and go through it and then digest it a little bit more. Right. And I do that. Sometimes I go back and like, uh, over our, like I think it's two weeks ago or a week ago when I was doing this monthly review for January, I actually looked at, at all the books I read in 2018 and then chose two to go back through and review. Mm-hmm. Cause I'm, even though I've done a review That's already, awesome. I had these notes. I'm like, oh, okay, it's, this, this would actually be really, really helpful again at this point. Mm-hmm. And so one of them was, for instance, a high growth handbook, which is something about like a, how to run startups. And it's like, we are now, when I read that book to now are two very different companies that I'm running. So I'm like, oh, okay, perspective would be really, really good again. And then I went back and found a couple of things like, oh, I didn't see this this way last mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's my system at least. Awesome, man. So you're incredibly busy right now building your business. How do you, and you're already, you're already kind of talking about this, but how do you prioritize learning? Like where do you put it in your schedule and what is most effective for you? 
outside of work or in work? Um, let's say, well, take it any way you want. Yeah. So I've consciously deprioritized individual learning at this point. And so like anything personal outside of work, I'm just, I, I understand that right now is going to be one of the craziest periods of my life. And so I've just kind of put that on the back burner. So, so like something like personal development, actually, that's learning. Not true. So stuff that where I would have been very conscious before. So for instance, I play music and I like, I play guitar, for example, and I've like mm-hmm. had very intentional progress before or like okay. learning photography or learning to draw or something like that. I've been very systematic about how to do that and have kind of sat those things on. I'd actually disagree with that. And I'd say that Martha's helping me a lot, but I'm learning more about how to be aware of emotions and how it affects me and mm-hmm. step back at that. So I'd say from a personal perspective, we have a chat every week where we kind of go over that stuff and how I've been tracking on it. Other than that, though, as far as how I usually would approach things, um, yeah, personal has been, been just taken a a serious backseat to work. But with with work stuff, I have several things that I'm tracking. So again, in my kind of master spreadsheet, um, a lot of them is just how I give feedback and how I communicate to the team. And then I think that a lot of the learning is honestly just by doing. And I'm a big fan of that. And so like, I don't think that if I planned what I was going to learn a year ago, like if what I would have, what I would have learned, I think would have been a very askew and I right. would have thought very, very small because I didn't know what I didn't know I needed to learn. And so I think just by scaling and doing things and like really challenging myself, a lot surfaces after the fact, I'm like, oh man, I've actually learned a ton in this scenario, mm-hmm. whereas I, I wouldn't have before. And so I think that a lot of my learning is structured just from pushing myself personally in work and trying to do new things and level up and doing mm-hmm. things that are uncomfortable. And then after the fact, I go, oh, okay, I actually learned X, Y, and Z. I learned how to handle the situation. I learned how to hire better. I learned how to train better. And that stuff after the fact, I reflect on it and we make you know, operational upgrades and we make system upgrades and I document all this stuff about what I've learned and try to reflect on that continuously. But I think if you have that mindset of like being very intentional and like being like, okay, I'm going to learn at these several things, you probably miss out on a lot of the stretch goals or stretch learning that you wouldn't have otherwise. And so that's, I'd say a little, a little haphazard, but it's getting done. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So something you keep bringing up and glossing over a little bit is feedback. So we know that in order to learn as quickly as possible, we need feedback as to how we're doing to keep us on track, to keep us in bounds, to keep keep us motivated. So how are you how are you getting that feedback? Is it you're giving it to yourself but through reflection? Is it via your team or a combination? Yeah. Yes. To all as many different areas as possible. So I have my, my personal reflection where basically monthly I tear everything down and and realize all the the stuff that I said I was going to do that I didn't do and face myself at that point. Weekly, Martha and I chat intermittently. I ask close friends of mine how I'm doing in certain things where I'm trying to improve at. So communication, relationships, empathy, things like that are are probably top of the bucket for me right now. Um, Justin, my business partner asking him how I'm doing in certain situations, but then also we have very structured feedback um, that I get from ex- an executive coach that I'm working with, as well as the team. So we do 360 review feedback. So I get a whole chunk of feedback from my team every quarter. Mm-hmm. And so looking at, at that and then going quarter by quarter. And then every time I get feedback, looking at the previous quarter and saying, okay, people address this as something in an area for improvement. Did I improve that? Yes or no? Okay. If not, how can I approximate towards that moving forward and comparing it? So I think, and this is the thing too, like people get static feedback and they might react to it, but taking the time and the space to actually process that, what that feedback means and how you can address it and make it part of your life. So that way, something you have to think about is something that people do not do very often. Mm. And so that's every time I get feedback, I I try to take it a little bit of time just go, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I shouldn't do that thing or say that thing. Of just being like, okay, what does that actually mean? How does that affect people? And like, why am I doing that? And and like thinking through the whole 360 degree view of why it's it's important. Like why people, why is somebody giving me feedback on this? And then choosing, okay, is this something I want to work on? Yes or no? Because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, also I have very limited capacity to, you know, let's say I get 500 things of feedback. I need to then parse through and choose the things that, you know, I, I have a North Star of where I want to be in life. Right. Okay. People may think that I can improve in certain ways, but that doesn't mean that it's going to give me where I want to be. Right. And so I think that, that that's where people also need to be very careful about external feedback. So people can give you feedback in a thousand different directions. But you should choose the ones that closely approximate where you want to go and maybe some blind spots that if addressed can get you closer where you want to be. So I think that 
ultimately to get to that point where you have super, a super high conviction about where you want to go, <laughs> coming back full circle here is, is silence and solitude and reflection and, and your own feedback loops and just time with yourself. And not a lot of time and influence from other people and saying, you know, society says this is the way we should do things. You know, I'm comparing myself to this person externally. That person's doing well in business and I should be like them. No, no, no. What's important to me and where do I want to be down the road? Like, where do I want to approximate to in the next five months, 10 months or whatever? Like, how can I level up who I am? And like, why is that the case? And looking at that, I think is way, way more important than, tr- than trying to make yourself who other people think you should be. God damn, that's beautiful. That's awesome, man. Quote post. Yeah. I've been, uh, I've been, I've, I've tossed around this idea a couple of times. Maybe I've saw it somewhere and I'm stealing it, but, uh, it's something like be your own philosopher. You know, like yeah. we, we tend to want to just find someone that we really admire and just do everything that they do without reflecting on, um, you know, what we really want to do and who we really are and what we value. And I think if people develop the courage to be their own philosopher and do the reflection and um, really, really put down on paper or really give themselves time to think about what they value and how their actions are lining up with that, uh, you're just going to be so much more successful and set yourself up to enjoy the life that you're living. Yeah. And I think that ultimately, the more I work on crystallizing what I value in, in kind of approximating towards that, the more I admire people who do the same thing in their world. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So recognizing that I may not value the same things as one of my good friends, but he, they have something like locked down in their mind. Like this is what I value and here's how I'm working on it. Mm-hmm. And nothing else distracts them, distracts them. The more I admire that person instead of, Hell yeah, man. I think a lot of people maybe have some success and their values have gotten th- them to a certain point where they try to project that into other people like everybody else needs to be that person. Right. What's something that you wish more people knew about you that they don't? I would say that just because I have a very successful company doesn't mean I care about f- personal financial gain. Um, people like I get a lot of weird comments, especially like we've been starting to do more YouTube um, content and people think that like, I just, especially cause we have supplement products. People think that we're just in it for money. Mm-hmm. And when the reality is that I've actually lost a, like a huge amount of money running per Like we, we haven't even taken enough money in the last two years to pay for tax liabilities and I don't have a salary. So I think that that's something that where, where people think that I'm in this game because I just want like either popularity or money or, or all these things. And I think that that's, just not the truth. So that's probably awesome. one, one of the top ones. Awesome. What, and this is my last one. What book or other resources had the biggest impact on you recently? I've kind of been, let me see what books I've read this year and I'll tell you which one is <laughs> perfect. Uh, yeah, I would actually say nothing as of recently. I would say that just t- getting back to, guarding my own time and having this protected time of reflection, which I kind of lost in the middle of last year. Coincidentally, last time you and I chatted, I think on the podcast is when everything was together and then everything fell, fell apart after that. So we'll see if that, that mm. <laughs> happens again. But yeah, I think that is being with myself, I think in kind of bringing it back to your point about having your own self-reflection and solitude. And I think that that's where I've learned the most in the last six weeks since the beginning of the year. I think that might be the most powerful answer you could have given because uh, so many people that listen to the show are so growth minded. They're constantly they, like, they're just like you and me, right? They're constantly in a new book, probably multiple at one time. And I think they suffer from some of the same things that you and I have of that information overload. And yeah, I hope if, if people get nothing else from this show than this, I hope you, I hope this is kind of a call to action to do some self reflection. Um, with that said, one of the biggest, one, a, a book that's had a huge impact on my life this past year is Essentialism. And it's, it goes right along with this conversation that we're having. So Essentialism, Digital Minimalism, look Ism. them up. Ism. I would say Anthony. actually best, best app before, before we're done here would be Waking Up by Sam Harris. Oh, I just downloaded yeah, it. Yeah, that's pumped. been like the, the most recent thing that 
my, my meditation game has been kind of on and off for a long period of time. I haven't learned more from any sort of source of meditation than I have from this app in the last month and a half. So I would highly recommend that app if you're looking to step up your meditation game. Awesome, dude. Anthony, where can they find out about you personally and all the things that you're working on? Yeah. So a company Perfect Keto is just perfectketo.com. And then my personal Instagram is dr. Anthony Gustin. I answer all DMs. If you guys have any questions, just shoot them my way. Anthony, you're the man. Appreciate Thank you so much. It. Hey guys, I get asked a lot what our most downloaded podcasts are because we have almost 200 shows recorded and people don't want to take the time to sift through and find the best ones. They want to know what's the best one in X, Y, or Z category. And so what I did is created a little document of the top five most downloaded shows and we put a little write up with each one of them. So each one of them comes with a high level overview of what the show is about, as well as some of the biggest actionable items, like the biggest takeaways from each show. And you can get free access to this by going to brutestrengthtraining.com backslash top five. That's top five brutestrengthtraining.com backslash top five. So it's the top five most downloaded podcast as well as the biggest takeaways for each enjoy this episode is finished but your training journey continues head over to brutestrengthtraining.com slash ssw and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately that's brutestrengthtraining.com slash ssw 